Oops. Somehow, goodness gracious. <laughs> They've changed these buttons so it went. It's, um, yeah. Okay, so we're online and um, I'm going to say good morning to everyone. And it usually takes uh, a few minutes for people to gather. <clears throat> Uh, I can see I'm going to have to change the name of this one. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Somehow I've frozen on... YouTube, I don't know why, but uh, Gertrude, hello Gertrude, um, I'm just in the process of bringing us live on uh, YouTube, so let's see if that works, okay, uh, all right, so today, we are going to read um, we're going to read Dr. Young's revelation when he realized um, the living God, okay? In other words, um, he was he uh, had been brought up as a pastor's son. He uh, was trying to counter. Um, he was trying to counter Nietzsche, who had said God is dead and we have killed him, and uh, that meant he had to find the living God. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I had some extra coffee delivered. <laughs> okay, so he, Nietzsche had declared God is dead, and Jung had to find where, where God lives and how he goes about doing the work of the Godhead. And that's what he did. And in this act of imagination, he has a revelation. And it's maybe the most important revelation in all of the Red Book, maybe at all of Jung's work. Because I know in my own life, I found... Um, I, I had a lot of trouble with religion because I was a totally logos, rational, related guy. I was a lawyer. I was a Marine. I had an MBA in financial economics, which is 15 courses in statistics by different names. <laughs> and, and so I, I didn't understand what religion was doing for me. And when I first became a lawyer, uh, I had uh, put a mailbox out on the road that said Donald L. Conover, attorney at law. Um, and I thought that would be wonderful. And that was uh, one of the least wonderful parts of my life, actually, um, that I, I discovered that I actually don't care for the practice of law. I really enjoyed the process of becoming a lawyer uh, right up until the point that I actually had to do it. And uh, then I found out, wow, I don't, I don't like this profession because I'm always dealing with other people's hardships. And that was not good. And so it took me a long time to figure that out. And 
finally, when the Red Book came out in 2009, and I read this, uh, I finally was able to put religion into context. And mind you, I'd been exposed to Buddhism pretty heavily from the age of 15. And um, good morning, Art. Nice to see you today. Um, and so this is for my lights, this is January 8th, 1914. So we're a little over two weeks after the first act of imagination that Jung was having in the Red Book. And so it's it, these things all came to him in a rush at first, at least. Uh, and so this particular act of imagination to me is the moment that he finally got to the point where he could say i have no need to believe i know and when i saw him say that on video on youtube i said oh my god i know too but what do i know and it took me a good decade to figure it out but i do did finally figure it out and it was in a large part due to this passage. So I'm going to read a fairly extensive piece of this packet passage first. Uh, and this is the passage in which he meets Isdabar. And there's a footnote here that says that Isdabar was an earlier name for Gilgamesh, which is the oldest. Uh, I think it's the oldest uh, lyrical story in captivity, uh, the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Uh, good morning, Judith. Nice to see you. Um, I have a friend of yours with me here, so I, you can also join the panel if you wish. <laughs> um, and so, in any case, um, I'm going to read right through the first piece of this to set the stage. Um, and um, and here's Jordan. Finally, I wasted enough time so Jordan could get on online. Hi, Jordan. We're I'm just going to re start reading, and I'm going to read this in big chunks. Um, okay. And my setup for it has been that this is the moment on January 8th, 1914, when 8th and 9th, let's say, when uh, Dr. Jung found the living God in his own life. Um, and Excellent. I need, to, I need to confirm the date of the other part of this. Um, let's see. Uh, it's rather long. Okay, the second day. Yep, 8th and 9th. January 8th and 9th, 1914. So I'm going to read fairly large chunks, not stopping for the footnotes to begin with, okay. just so we can all envision it. First day. I'm on page 277 of the Red Book by C.G. Young, Reader's Edition. Uh, Edited by Sonar Shamdasani. First day. But on the third night, a desolate mountain range blocks my way, though a narrow valley gorge allows me to enter. The way leads inevitably between two high rock faces. My feet are bare and injure themselves on the jagged rocks. Here the path becomes slippery. One half of the way is white, the other black. I step onto the black side and recoil horrified. It is hot iron. I step onto the white half, it is ice. But so it must be. I dart across and onward, and finally the valley widens into a mighty rocky basin. A narrow path winds up along vertical rocks to the mountain ridge at the top. As I approach the top, 
a mighty booming resounds from the other side of the mountain, like ore being pounded. The sound gradually swells and echoes thunderously in the mountain. As I reach the pass, I see an enormous man approach from the other side. Two bull horns rise from his great head, and a rattling suit of armor covers his chest. His black beard is ruffled and decked with exquisite so stones. Uh, and I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to share my screen so you can now see Isdabar and all his glory. All right. His black beard is ruffled and decked with exquisite so stones. The giant, giant is carrying a sparkling double axe in, in his hand like those used to strike bulls. Before I can recover from my amazed fright, the giant is standing before me. I look at his face. It is faint and pale and deeply wrinkled. His almond-shaped eyes look at me astonished. Horror takes hold of me. This is Isdabar, the mighty, the bull man. He stands and looks at me. His face speaks of co consuming inner fear, and his hands and knees tremble. Is Dabar the powerful bull trembling? Is he frightened? I call out to him. Okay, so before I get into the exchange between Jung and Isdabar, um, I just want to mention to look at the bottom of this image which Dr. Jung painted, and you'll see Dr. Jung, his our arms are outstretched up toward his ankle, up toward Isdabar's ankle. So you see how uh, huge he sees Isdabar in this passage. And he's on his knees, uh, Jung is on his knees, and the great giant is before him. And this is the exchange they have. Actually, really quickly before you, you go into the exchange. Yeah. I think visually it's important to note that there are four trinities, like one on either side of his legs, one on either side of his head, and then three quaternities above his shoulders. And I think that that feels to be psychological function, Three being Trinity, being the first group, triangle, Venus number, quaternity being the four psychological functions. Um, I don't know if that's of note, but just from the number of those golden um, stones or golden things, um, that seems to be relatively relatively important visually. Yep, that that and the. And the crocodiles at his legs, and the, all the snakes that are all the going, snakes going around him. Uh, so this is quite a scary scene. And uh, yet he says, "Is he frightened?" I call out to him. Oh, Isdabar, most powerful, spare my life and forgive me for lying like a worm in your path. Isdabar, Isdabar. I do not want your life. Where do you come from? I, I come from the West. Isdabar, you come from the West? Do you know of the Western lands? Is this the right way to the Western lands? I, I come from a Western land whose coast washes against the great Western sea. Isdabar, does the sun sink in that sea or does it touch the solid land in its decline? I. The sun sinks far beyond the sea, Isdabar. Beyond the sea? What lies there, Isdabar? Or I, there's nothing but empty space there. As you know, the earth is round, and moreover, it turns around the sun, Isdabar. Damned one, where do you get such knowledge? So there is no immortal land where the sun goes down to be reborn? Are you speaking the truth? His eyes flicker with fury and fear. He steps a thundering pace closer. I tremble. I, oh, Isdabar, most powerful one, forgive me my presumptuousness. 
but I'm really speaking the truth. I come from a land where this is proven science and where people live who travel around the world with their ships. Our scholars know through measurement how far the sun is from each point of the surface of the earth. It is a celestial body that lies unspeakably far out in unending space. Isdabar, unending, did you say? Is the space of the world unending and we can never reach the sun? I, most powerful one, insofar as you are mortal, you can never reach the sun. I, I see, I see him overcome with suffocating fear. Isdabar, I am mortal and I shall never reach the sun and never reach immortality. He smashes his axe with a powerful clanging blow on the rock. Isdabar, be gone, miserable weapon. You are not much use. How should you be of use against infinity, against the eternal void, and against the unreplenishable? This is no one left. There is no one left for you to conquer. Smash yourself. What it? What's it worth? In the west, the sun sinks into the lap of glowing clouds in bright crimson. So go away, sun, thrice damned God, and wrap yourself in your immortality. He smashes, he snatches the smashed piece of his axe from the ground and hurls it toward the sun. Here you have your sacrifice, your last sacrifice. He collapses and sobs like a child. I stand shaking and hardly dare stir. Isdabar, miserable worm, where did you suckle on this poison? I, O oh, Isdabar, most powerful one, what you call poison is science. In our country, we are nurtured on it from youth, and that may be one reason why we haven't properly flourished and remained so dwarfish. When I see you, however, it seems to me as if we are all somewhat poisoned, Isdabar. No stronger being has ever cut me down. No monster has ever resisted my strength. But your poison worm, which you have placed in my way, has lamed me to the marrow. Your magical poison is stronger than the army of Tiamat. He lies as if paralyzed, stretching, stretched out on the ground. Oh, God's help, here lies your son, cut down by the invisible serpent's bite in his heel. Oh, if only I had crushed you when I saw you and never heard your words. I. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to stop there momentarily. Uh, so Isdabar has learned some truth about science, uh, and that has cut him down. And he's now lying on the, on the ground weak, but he's still in conversation with Jung. And, um, and so I wanted to just give everybody a chance to say something. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's important there that the science diluted diluted his pure nature and in that sense this factual limitation that then the limitation itself is what expressed infinity has him just come his myth is destroyed basically yes. well it's it's destroyed for tonight for well, right, January right, for 1914. Right. Myth, and I think that's which like, it, yeah. it has lasted since it's the oldest myth that we know of, I think. Um right. going going back to um uh, to Gilgamesh and Inkadu and Gilgamesh fights Tiamat uh which is a great monster. And um, so this legend has lasted that long. But on... Yeah, and Tiamat's the mother of all gods. I mean, so... Right. And, and she's extremely uh, 
I think she's a monster. Uh, I think also, is she not? That and also Tiamat then would be, <clears throat> to me, akin to Gaia, you know, the, yeah. the whole of nature on earth, as it were. But what's happening here is the whole of nature on earth is now being included in this vast, infinite, you know, eternity of a void. Right. Okay, so let me uh, read on. I'm going to read another three pages uh, because I want this. Um, I want this. Uh, oh, and there is a footnote here. The Babylonian mythology, Tiamat, the mother of the gods, waged war with an army of demons. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Well, and I think your statement of, oh, this is only this night, you know, this week, because that to me is an expression of alan watts idea that you have no responsibility to be who you were even five minutes ago yeah. so young dr young is letting it flow and then the transformation will occur and he will no longer be this person very soon right okay so so anyway Jung has run into him in his act of imagination and he's it's the oldest legend um, known and the oldest myth known and so then Jung says uh or let me finish what Isdabar had said again oh if only I had crushed you when I saw you and never heard your words I oh Isdabar great and pitiable one had I known that my knowledge would cut you down I would have held my tongue but I wanted to speak the truth, Isdabar. You call poison truth? Is poison truth or is truth poison? Do not our astrologers and priests also speak the truth? And yet there does not, theirs does not act like poison. I, oh, Isdabar, night is falling and it will get cold up here. Shall I not? Fetch you help from men, Isdabar, let it be, and answer me instead. I, but we cannot philosophize here all of all places. Your wretched condition demands help. Isdabar, I say to you, let it be. If I should perish this night, so be it. Just give me an answer. I, I'm afraid my words are weak if they are to heal. Isdabar, they cannot bring about something more grave. The disas disaster has already happened. So tell me what you know. Perhaps you even have a magic word that it counteracts the poison. I, my words, O oh most powerful one, are poor and have no magical power. Isdabar, no matter, speak. I, I don't doubt that your priests speak the truth. It is certainly a truth. Only it runs contrary to our truth, Isdabar. Are there then two sorts of truth? I. It seems to me to be so. Our truth is that which comes to us from the knowledge of outer things. The truth of your priests is that which comes to you from inner things, Isdabar. That was a salutary word, I. I'm fortunate that my weak words have relieved you. Oh, if only I knew many more words that could help you. It has now grown cold and dark. I'll make a fire to warm us. Isdabar, do that as it might help. I gathered wood and lit a big fire. The holy fire warms me. Now, tell me, how did you make a fire so swiftly and mysteriously? I, all I need are matches. Look, they are small pieces of wood with a special substance at the tip. Rubbing them against the box produces fire. Isdabar, that is astonishing. Where did you learn this art? I, everyone has matches where I come from, but this is the least of it. We can also fly with the help of useful machines. Isdabar, you can fly like birds? If your words did not contain such mag powerful magic, I would say to you, you were lying. 
I. I'm certainly not lying. Look, I also have a timepiece, for example, which shows the exact time of day. Isdvar, this is wonderful. It is clear that you come from a strange and marvelous land. You certainly come from the blessed Western lands. Are you immortal? I. I am mortal? There is nothing more mortal than we are. Isdvar, what? You are not even immortal, and you get to understand such arts? I, unfortunately, your science has, our science has still not yet succeeded in finding a method against death. Isdabar, who then taught you such arts? I, in the course of centuries, men have made many discoveries through precise observation in the science of outer things. Isdabar. But this science is the awful magic that has lamed me. How can it be that you are still alive even though you drink from this poison every day? I, we've grown accustomed to this over time because men get used to everything. But we're still somewhat lamed. On the other hand, this science also has great advantages, as you've seen. What we've lost in terms of force We've rediscovered many times through mastering the force of nature. Istvar, isn't it pathetic to be so wounded? For my part, I draw my own force from the force of nature. I leave the secret force to the cowardly conjurers and womanly magicians. If I crush another's skull to pulp, that would stop his awful magic. I, but don't you realize how the touch of our magic has worked upon you? Terribly, I think, Isdvar. Unfortunately, you are right. I, now you perhaps see that we had no choice. We had to swallow the poison of science. Otherwise, we would have met the same fate as you have. We'd be completely lamed if we encountered it unsuspecting and unprepared. This poison is so insurmountably strong that everyone, even the strongest, and even the eternal gods perish because of it. If our life is dear to us, we prefer to sacrifice a piece of our life force rather than abandon ourselves to certain death. Isdabar, I no longer think that you come from the blessed Western lands. Your country must be desolate, full of paralysis and renunciation. I yearn for the East, where the pure source of life giving wisdom flows. We sit silently at the flickering fire. The night is cold. Isdabar groans and looks up at the starry sky above. Isdabar, most terrible day of my life, unending, so long, so long, wretched magical art. Our priests know nothing or else they could have protected me from it. Even the gods die, he says. Have you no gods anymore? I. No, words are all we have. Isdabar. But, these, but are these words powerful? I. So they claim, but one notices nothing of this. Isdabar. We do not see the gods either, and yet we believe that they exist. We recognize their workings in natural events. I, science has taken from us the cat capacity of belief. Isdabar, what you have lost, that too? How then do you live? I, we live thus, with one foot in the cold and one foot in the hot, and for the rest, Come what may, Isdabar, you express yourself darkly. Aye. So it also is with us. It is dark, Isdabar. Can you bear it? I, not particularly well. I personally don't find myself at ease with it. For that reason, I've set out to the east, to the land of the rising sun, to seek the light that we lack. Where then does the sun rise? Isdabar, the earth is, as you say, completely round, thus the sun rises nowhere. I, I mean, do you have the light that we lack? Isdabar, look at me. I flourish in the light of the eastern world, 
From this Western. you can, pardon? Western. No, it says Eastern. Look at me. I flourish in the light of the Eastern world. This is Isdabar right. speaking. From this you can measure how fruitful this light is. But if you come from such a dark land, then beware of such an overpowering light. You could go blind just as we all are somewhat blind. I, if your light is as fantastic as you are, then I will be careful. Isdabar, you do well by this. I, I long for your truth. Isdabar, as I long for the Western lands, I warn you. Silence descends. It is late at night. We fall asleep next to the to the fire. Okay, I'll stop there for a moment. It is interesting. In my P, in my PDF, it said Western, and what's interesting about that when it's supposed to be you're right, it's supposed to be Eastern, and just that typo is kind of what happens when science is mistaken, and you know that whole piece. <laughs> I could I could go on a whole mythology about well, wow Isdabar came over why is he thirsting in the light of the Western world when he's lame so that could send me off on a serious rabbit hole philosophically psychologically <laughs> when in reality it's just a typo and right. you know, I, was, I was I was supposed to look at it and go mm, that, that that doesn't work <laughs> right <laughs> uh, yeah. Because yeah, the PDF has Western, where it's it, clearly you're right. In the actual textbook, it's what Eastern. Yeah, Michelle says, "I want to be a house cat." Cats never question if they're cats or if they're good cats. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. But I do think it's funny about Michelle with being a house cat. Um, I saw a cartoon a couple weeks ago where there are two people trying to witness. You know, and they're at the front door. Um, and the cat is standing on the doormat, the welcome mat, looking up. And they said, do you have time for us to tell you about our Lord and Savior? And the cat says, there's only room for one deity in this house. <laughs> <laughs> and Dionysus makes the comment, is the bar speaking with the last man? And I, to that, I would add. Uh, Isdabar is speaking with the last man of the modern age. Okay, mm -hmm. this moment is the beginning of postmodernism. Okay, everybody thought that they were very modern uh, in the 19th century, and they got to the point where God was dead, and um, then uh, the 20th century is a monument to the stupidity of man. Okay, we killed 280 million people um, in the 20th century, uh, and all based on um, all kinds of um, stuff. <laughs> so... All right. Well, it's so they, the fascination with the toys, you know, the fascination with the tools, the utilities that, you know, even, you know, clothing, textiles weren't such a such a big deal anymore. You know, making right. something from a burlap sack versus having a tweed or I mean, even just clothing and attire changed the look literally of most people. Okay, so now, reading on, I'm going to read a way, quite a ways here, but it's, we need the context. I wandered toward the south and found the unbearable heat of solitude with myself. I wandered toward the north and found the cold depth from which all the world dies. I withdrew to my western land where the men are rich in knowing and doing, and I began to suffer from the sun's empty darkness. And I threw everything from me and wandered toward the east, where the light rises daily. I went to the east like a child. I did not ask. I simply waited. Cheerful flowery meadows and lovely spring forests hemmed my path. But in the third night, the heaviness came, 
It stood before me like a range of cliffs full of sorrowful desolation, and everything tried to deter me from following my life's path. But I found the entrance and the narrow way. The torment was great since it was not for nothing that I have had pushed the two dissipated and dissolute ones away from me. I unsuspectingly absorb what I reject. What I accept enters that part of my soul which I do not know. I accept what I do to myself, but I reject what is done to me. So the path of my life led me beyond the rejected opposites, united in smooth and, alas, extremely painful sides of the way which laid before me. I stepped on them, but they burned and froze my soul. And thus I reached the other side. But the poison of the serpent whose head you crush enters you through the wound in your heel. And thus the serpent becomes more dangerous than it was before. Since whatever I reject is nevertheless in my nature, I thought it was without. And so I believed that I could destroy it. But it resides in me and has only assumed a passing outer form and stepped toward me. It destroyed its form and believed, I destroyed its form and believed that I was a conqueror, but I have not yet overcome myself. The outer, outer opposition is an image of my inner opposition. Once I realize this, I remain silent and think of the chasm of antagonism in my soul. Outer oppositions are easy to overcome. They indeed exist, but nevertheless, you can be united with yourself. They will indeed burn and freeze your soul, but only your souls. It hurts, but you continue and look toward distant goals. As I rose to the highest point and my hope wanted to look out toward the east, a miracle happened. As I moved toward the east, one from the east hurried toward me and strove toward the sinking light. I wanted light, he wanted night. I wanted to rise, he wanted to sink. I was dwarfish like a child while he was enormous, like an elementally powerful hero. Knowledge lamed me while he was blinded by the fullness of the light. And so he hur he, we hurried toward each other. He from the light, I from the darkness. He strong, I weak. He God, I serpent. He ancient, I utterly knew. He unknowing, I knowing. He fantastic, I sober. He brave, powerful, I cowardly, cunning. But we were both astonished to see one another on the border between morning and evening. I was a child and grew like a greening tree and let the wind and distant cries and commotion of opposites blow calmly through my branches. I was a boy and mocked fallen heroes. I was a youth pushing aside their clutching grips left and right, and so I did not anticipate the powerful, blind, and immortal one who wandered longingly after the sinking sun, who wanted to cleave the ocean down to its bottom so he could descend into the source of life. That which hurries toward the rising is small. That which approaches the descent is great. Hence I was small, since I simply came from the depths of my descent. I had been where he yearned to be. He who descends is great, and it would be easy for him to smash me. A god who looks like the sun does not hunt worms, but the worm aims at the heel of the powerful one and will prepare him for the descent that he needs. His power is great and blind. He is marvelous to look at and frightening, but the serpent finds its spot. A little poison and the great one falls. The words of the one who rises have no sound and taste bitter. It is not a sweet poison, but one that is fatal for all gods. Alas, it is my dearest, most beautiful friend, he who rushes across pursuing the sun and wanting to marry himself with the immeasurable 
mother as the son does, how closely akin, indeed how completely one are the serpent and the god. The word which was our deliverer has become a deadly weapon, a serpent that secretly stabs. No longer do outer opposites stand in my way, but my own opposite comes toward me and rises up hugely before me, and we block each other's way. The word of the serpent certainly defeats the danger, but my way remains barred since I then had to fall from paralysis into blindness, just as the powerful one fell into paralysis to dis escape his blindness. I could not reach the blinding power of the sun, just as he, the powerful one, cannot reach the ever-fruited womb of darkness. I seem to be denied power while he is denied, re denied rebirth, but I escape the blindness that comes with power and he escapes the nothingness that comes with death. My hope, my hope for the fullness of light shatters. Just as his longing for boundless, for boundless conquered life shatters, I had felled the strongest, and the God climbs down to mortality. Uh, okay, then, then there are some incantations here. The mighty one fell, he lies on ground. Power must subside for the sake of life. The circum circumference of outer life should be made smaller. Much more secrecy, solitary fires, fire, caverns, dark, wide forests, sparsely peopled settlements, quietly flowing streams, silent winter and summer nights, small ships and carriages, and secure is dwellings, the rare and precious. Far afar, from afar, wanders walk along solitary roads, looking here and there. Hurrying becomes impossible, patience grows. And then another. The noise of the days of the world falls silent and the war warming fire blazes and sigh. Sitting at the fire, the shades of those gone before wail softly and give news of the past. Come to the solitary fire, you blind and lame ones, and hear of both kinds of truth. The blind will be lamed and the lamed will be blinded, yet the shared fire warms both in the lengthening night. An old secret fire burns between us living sparse light and ample warmth. The primordial fire that conquers every necessity shall burn again, since the night of the world is wide and cold, and the need is great. The well-protected fire brings together those from far away and those who are cold, those who do not see one another and cannot reach one another, and it conquers suffering and shatters need. The words uttered at the fire are ambiguous and deep and show life the right way. The blind shall be lamed so that he will not run into the abyss, and the lamed shall be blind so that he will not look at things beyond his reach with longing and contempt. Um, both may be aware of their deep helplessness as that so that they respect the holy fire again, as well as the shades sitting at the hearth and the words that encircle the flames. Okay, I'll stop there for a moment. It really reminds me the snakes and the alligators, both reptiles, one with legs, not lame, one without legs, lame, but they both travel between the worlds inside and outside easily or underwater into the cave, out into the light, both of them into the air. Um, and also it reminds me of um, Manly P. Hall, the, when, when humanity um, resumes speaking and fluency in the visual language, veils will be lifted from the eyes. 
And I think here, then talking about that holy fire, there's the that which is, and just you know, Jung's several small words being the poison in Isdabar's heel. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do you want do you want to read from here? I'm sure, going to sure. take a short stop, but please go ahead and read it. Okay. The ancients called the saving word the logos, or logos, an expression of the divine reason. So much unreason was in man that he needed reason to be saved. If one waits long enough, one sees how the gods all change into serpents and the underworld dragons in the end. This is also the fate of the logos. In the end, it poisons us all. In time, we were all poisoned, but unknowingly, we kept the one, the powerful one, the eternal wanderer in us away from the poison. We spread poison and paralysis around us in that we want to educate all the world around us into reason. Some have their reason in thinking, others in feeling, both are servants of Logos and in secret become worshipers of the serpent. You can subjugate yourself, shackle yourself in irons, whip yourself bloody every day. You have crushed yourself, but not overcome yourself. Precisely through this, you have helped the powerful one, strengthened, strengthened your paralysis and promoted his blindness. He would like to see it in others and inflict it upon them and would like to force the logos on you and others longingly and tyrannically with blind obstinacy and vacant stubbornness. Give him a taste of logos. He is afraid and he already trembles from afar since he suspects that he has become outdated and that a tiny droplet of the poison of logos will paralyze him. But because he is your beautiful, much loved brother, you will act slavishly toward him and you would like to spare him as you have spared none of your fellow men. You spared no merry and no powerful means to strike your fellow men with a poisoned arrow. Paralyzed game is an unworthy prey. The powerful huntsman who wrestles the bull to the ground and tears the lion to pieces and strikes the army of Tiamat is your bow's worthy target. If you live as he whom you are, he will come running against you impetuously and you can hardly miss him. He will lay violent hands on you and force you into slavery if you do not remember your terrible weapon, which you have always used in his service against yourself. You will be cunning, terrible, and cold if you make the beautiful and much loved fall. But you should not kill him even if he suffers and writhes in unbearable agony, bind the holy Sebastian to a tree and slowly and rationally shoot arrow after arrow into his twitching flesh. When you do so, remind yourself that each arrow that strikes him spares one of your dwarfish and lame brothers. So you may shoot many arrows, but there is a misunderstanding that occurs all too frequently and is almost ineradicable. Men always want to destroy the beautiful and much loved outside of themselves, but never within themselves. Continuing. He, the beautiful and most loved one, came to me from the east, from that place which I was seeking to reach. Admiringly, I saw his power and magnificence and I recognized that he was striving for, for precisely what I had abandoned, namely my dark human milling crowd of objection, abjection. I recognized the blindness and unknowingness of his striving, which worked against my desire. And I opened his eyes and lamed his powerful limbs with a poisoned stab. And he lay crying like a child, as that which he was, a child a primordial grown child that required human logos. 
So he lay before me, helpless, my blind God, who had become half seen and paralyzed, and compassion seized me. It was plain to me that I should not let him die. He who approached me from the rising, from that place where he could be well, from which I could never reach. He whom I sought, I now possessed. The East could give me nothing other than him, the sick and fallen one. And I'll pause there now that you're back. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think so, that to me, the most ahead. important line was in the, the last sentence of the previous paragraph. Men always want to destroy the beautiful and much loved outside of themselves, but never within themselves. Yep. And there it is underlined in my book. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. Uh, that's, that whole ownership piece is so important. Yeah. And so I love how everybody's paralyzed. I mean, you get this, the lame, you don't want, the blind become lame, so they don't wander off into nothingness, the abyss. And then the lame blind, so they don't, you know, get forlorn about not being able to go beyond. Yeah. Okay, uh, why don't you go ahead and read the rest of this description, and then I, I want to read the uh, part where Isdabar is revived. Okay. Okay. You need to undertake only half of the way. He will undertake the other half. If you go beyond him, blind, blindness will be, befall you. If he goes beyond you, paralysis will befall him. Therefore, and insofar as it is the manner of the gods to go beyond mortals, they become paralyzed and become as helpless as children. Divinity and humanity should remain preserved if man should remain before the god and the God remained before the man. The high blazing flame is the middle way, whose luminous course runs between the human and the divine. The divine primordial power is blind, since its face has become human. The human is the face of the Godhead. If the God comes near you, then plead for your life to be spared, since the God is loving horror. The ancients said, it is terrible to fall into the hands of the living God. They spoke thus because they knew, since they were still close to the ancient forest, and they turned green like the trees in a childlike manner and ascended far away toward the east. Consequently, they fell into the hands of the living God. They learned to kneel and to lie with their faces down, to beg for pity, and they learned to live in servile fear and be, to be grateful. But he who saw him, the terrible, beautiful one with his black velvet eyes and the long eyelashes, the eyes that do not see, but merely gaze lovingly and fearfully, he has learned to cry out and whimper so that he can at least reach the ear of the Godhead. Only your fearful cry can stop the God. And then you see that the God also trembles since he stands confronting his face. Uh, Jordan, you uh, there, there was a freeze out, so um, please uh, begin the paragraph. Consequently, they fell into the hands of the living God. Certainly, is my video back? Is it? Yep. Okay. Consequently, they fell into the hands of the living God. They learned to kneel and to lie with their faces down, to beg for pity. And they learned to live in servile fear and to be grateful. But he who saw him, the terrible, beautiful one with his black velvet eyes and the long eyelashes, the eyes that do not see, but merely gaze lovingly and fearfully, he has learned to cry out and whimper so that he can at least reach the ear of the Godhead. Only your fearful cry can stop the God. And then you see that the God also trembles since he stands confronting his face, his observing gaze in you, and he feels unknown power. The God is afraid of man. If my God is lamed, I must stand by him since I cannot abandon the much loved. I sense that he is my lot, my brother who abided and grew in the light while I was in the darkness and fed myself with poison. 
It is good to know such things. If we are surrounded by night, our brother stands in the fullness of the light, doing his great deeds, tearing up the lion, the lion and killing the dragon. And, his, and he draws his bow against ever more distant goals until he becomes aware of the sun wandering high up in the sky and wants to catch it. But when he has discovered his valuable prey, then your longing for the light also awakens. You discard the fetters and take yourself to the place of the rising light. And thus you rush toward each other. He believed he could simply capture the sun and encountered the worm of the shadows. You thought that in the East, you could drink from the source of the light and catch the horned giant before whom you fall to your knees. His essence is blind, excessive longing and tempestuous force. My essence is seeing limitation and the incapacity of cleverness. He possesses in abundance what I lack. Consequently, I will also not let him go. The bull god who once wounded Jacob's hip and whom I have now and I have now lamed. I want to make his force my own. It is therefore prudent to keep alive the severely afflicted so that his force continues to support me. We miss nothing more than divine force. We say, yes, indeed. Whoops. Yes, indeed. This is how it should or could be. This or that should be achieved. We speak thus and stand thus and look about us embarrassed to see whether somehow something will occur. And should something happen, we look on it and say, yes, indeed, we understand it is this or that, or it is similar to this or that. And thus we speak and stand and look around to see whether somewhere something might happen. Something always happens, but we do not happen since our God is sick. We have seen him dead with the venomous gaze of the basilisk on his face, and we have understood that he is dead. We must think of his healing, and yet again, I feel it quite, quite clearly that my life would have broken in half had I failed to heal my God. Hence, I abided with him in the long, cold night. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the things that, that I want to point out, and uh, there's one sentence by Lawrence Jaffe, who was the son of uh, the secretary to Carl Jung, who uh, put the memories, dreams, reflections together. And he said, the purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us the healing God, the healing power, which resides in our unconscious. And isn't that the essence of every religion that uh, if we if we are sincere in our following of the rituals, that it opens for us uh, the healing power that resides in our unconscious. And, and so that so in a sense, Jungian psychology is a, a religion, but uh, it's more than that because it's a science and it, uh, it identified um, this fact, and he identified this fact here, that you can't let your God die. You have to keep it alive. And so uh, now we get to the second day. And in the second day, um, Jung now finds the answer, and uh, it's very powerful, I think. So, and actually, before, before you go on there, I think right. bringing up Lawrence Joffe's quote, to access and make accessible to us that healing power that resides in the unconscious. Well, what's interesting about that is I find one of the, one of, one of the methods I find most effective is simply gazing into an image for one minute at about 15 20 seconds you kind of feel a, your thoughts just go oh front row seat i get a break 
But what happens is then you're literally steeping in the hot springs or the midnight ocean of the unconscious. And it's like going to, to meet them to the imagination gas station, because after a minute, not making the image do anything, no goals, no solutions, just being and steeping in the image to me accesses that healing power. And it, it, it really feels to clean, clean me out when I do that. And it's, it's an interesting, simple 60 seconds, you know, and it's that intense and that powerful, I think. Right. Um, okay. So now I'm going to read on, on the second day where I'm on page 291 of the red book by CG young readers edition. <clears throat> and, um, and by the way, um, someone mentioned to me this morning that I require people to have the re reader's edition. That's actually not true. Uh, you could work with the with the folio edition, the big book, uh, but I just find that I can't handle the big book <laughs> for these presentations. So therefore, it's it's easier to. Um, read the reader's edition so that everybody can follow these active imaginations. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, <clears throat> we're on January the 9th, 1914. <clears throat> no dream gave me the saving word. Isdabar lay silent and stiff all night until daybreak. I paced the mountain ridge, pondering and looking back at my Western lands, where there is so much knowledge and so much possibility of help. I love Isbar, and I do not want him to wither away miserably. But where should help come from? No one will travel the hot, cold path. And I, I am afraid to return to that path. And in the East, was there possibly help there? But what about the unknown dangers that loom there? I do not want to go blind. What use would that be to Isdabar? I cannot carry this lamed one as a blind man either. Yes, yes, if I were powerful like Isdabar, what use is science here? Toward evening, I went up to Isdabar and spoke to him. Isdabar, my prince, listen. I will not let you decline. The second evening is falling. We have no food and we are bound to die if I cannot find help. We cannot expect any help from the West, but help is possible for the, from the East. Did you meet anyone on your way whom we could call on for help? Isdabar, let it be, my death come when it will. I. My heart bleeds at the thought of leaving you here without having done the utmost to help you. Isdabar, what help is your magical power to you? If you were strong as I am, you could carry me, but your poison can only destroy and not help. I, if we were in my land, swift wagons could bring us help. Isdabar, if we were in my land, your poison barb would not have reached me. I, tell me, do you know of no help from the side of the east? Isdabar, the way there is long and lonely, and when you reach the plains after crossing the mountains, you will meet the powerful sun, which will blind you. I, but what if I wandered by night, and if I sheltered from the sun during the day? Isdabar. In the night, all the serpents and dragons crawl out of their holes, and you, unarmed, will ineb inevitably fall victim to them. Let it be. How would this help? My legs have withered and are numb. I prefer not to bring home the booty of this journey. I, should I risk everything? Isdabar, useless. Nothing is gained if you die. I. Let me think it over a bit. Perhaps a saving thought will yet come to me. I withdraw and sit down on a rock 
high above the ridge of, of the mountain. And this speech begin, began in me. Great Isdabar, you are in a hopeless position, and I know less. What can be done? It is not always necessary to act. Sometimes thinking is better. I am basically convinced that Isdabar is hardly real in the ordinary sense, but is a fantasy. It would help if the situation were considered from another angle. Considered. Considered. It is remarkable that even here, thoughts echo. One must be quite alone. But this will hardly last. He will, of course, not accept that he is a fantasy, but instead claim that he is completely real and that he can only be helped in a real way. Nevertheless, it would be worth trying this means once. I will appeal to him. I, my prince, powerful one, listen. A thought came to me that might save us. I think you are not at all real, but only a fantasy. Isdabar, I am terrified by this thought. It is murderous. Do you even mean to declare me unreal? Now that you have lamed me so pitifully, I, perhaps I have not made myself clear enough and have spoken too much in the language of the Western lands. I do not mean to say that you are not real at all, of course, but only as real as a fantasy. If you could accept this, much would be gained. Is to borrow. What would be gained by this? Are you tormenting? You are a tormenting devil. I, pitiful one. I will not torment you. The hand of the doctor does not seek to torment, even if it causes grief. Can you really not accept that you are a fantasy? fantasy? Isdabar, woe betide me. In what magic do you want to entangle me? Should it help me if I take myself for a fantasy? I, you know that the name one bears means a lot. You also know that one often gives the sick new names to heal them. For with a new name, they come by the new essence. Your name is your essence, Isdabar. You are, right. you are right. Our priests also say this. I. So are you prepared to admit that you are a fantasy, Isdabar? If it helps, yes. <laughs> the inner voice now spoke to me as follows. While admittedly he is a fantasy now, the situation remains extremely complex. A fantasy cannot be simply negated and treated with resignation. Either it calls for action. Anyway, he is a, it calls, or I'm sorry, a fantasy cannot be simply negated and treated with resignation either. It calls for action. Anyway, he is a fantasy and thus considerably more volatile. I think I can see a way forward. I can take him on my back for now. I went to Isdabar and said to him, a way has been found. You have become light, lighter than a feather. Now I can carry you. I put my arms around him and lift him up from the ground. He is lighter than air and I struggle to keep my feet on the ground since my load lifts me up into the air. Isdabar. That was a masterstroke. Where are you carrying me? I, I'm going to carry you down into the Western land. My comrades will happily accommodate such a large fantasy. Once we have crossed the mountains and have reached the houses of hospitable men, I can calmly go about finding a means to restore you completely again. Carrying him on my back, I climbed down the small rock path with great care more in danger of being whirled aloft by the wind than losing balance because of my load and plunging down the mountainside. I hang on to, all, to my all too lightweight load. Finally, we reach the bottom of the valley in the way of the hot and cold pain. But this time I am blown by a whistling east wind down through the narrow rocks and across the fields toward inhabited places making no contact with the painful way. 
Spurred on, I hasten through beautiful lands. I see two people ahead of me, Ammonius and the Red One. When we are right behind them, they turn round and run off into the fields with horrified cries. I must have proved a strange sight indeed. Isdabar, who are these misshapen ones? Are these your comrades? I. these are not men. They are so-called relics of the past, which one still often encounters in the Western lands. They used to be very important. Now that they're, they're now used mostly as shepherds. Is the bird. What a wondrous country. But look, <laughs> is isn't it that a town? Don't you want to go there? I uh, no, God forbid, I don't want to crowd a crowd together since the enlightened lot live there. Can't you smell them? They're actually dangerous since they cook the strongest poisons from which even I must protect myself. The people there are totally paralyzed, wrapped in a brown poisonous vapor, and can only move with artificial means. But you need not worry. Night has almost fallen, and no one will see us. Moreover, no one would admit to having seen me. I know an out-of-the-way house here. I have close friends there who will take us in for the night. Isdabar and I come to a quiet, dark garden in a secluded house. I hide Isdabar under the drooping branches of a tree, go up to the door of the house and knock. I ponder the door it is much too small. I will never be able to get Isdabar through it. Yet, a fantasy takes up no space. Why did this excellent thought not occur to me earlier? I return to the garden and with no difficulty squeeze Isdabar into the size of an egg and put him in my pocket. Then I walk into the welcoming house where Isdabar should find healing. You know, what's interesting here to me is when the name is your essence, shaman's changing the name to introduce a new healing essence. Isdabar means mass of fire, so a solar deity. So it's interesting here where um, Isdabar searching for, you know, where does the sun go, is searching for where he himself goes. Thus my God found salvation. He was saved precisely by what one would actually consider fatal namely by declaring him a fragment of the imagination. How often has it been assumed that the gods have been brought to their end in this way? This was obviously a serious mistake, since this was precisely what saved the god. He did not pass away, but became a living fantasy, whose workings I could feel in my own body. My inherent heaviness, uh, faded, and the hot and cold way of pain no longer burned and froze my souls. The weight no longer kept me pressed to the ground, but instead the wind carried me lightly like a feather while I carried the giant. One used to believe that one could murder a god, but the god was saved. He forged a new axe in the fire and plunged again into the flood of light of the east to resume his ancient cycle. But he, but we clever men crept around lamed and poisoned and did not even know that we lacked something. But I loved my God and took him to the house of men. Since I was convinced he was also really lived as a fantasy and should therefore not be left behind, wounded and sick. And hence, I experienced the miracle of my body losing its heaviness when I burdened myself with the God. St. Christopher the giant bore his burden with difficulty, despite the fact that he bore only the Christ child. But I was as small as a child bore a giant. But I was as small as a child and bore a giant, and yet my burden lifted me up. 
the Christ child became an easy burden for the giant Christopher, since Christ himself said, my yoke is sweet and my burden is light. We should not bear Christ as he is unbearable, but we should be Christ's, for then our yoke is sweet and our burden easy. This tangible and apparent world is, no rea is one reality, but fantasy is the other reality. So long as we le leave the God outside us, apparent and intangible, he is unbearable and hopeless. But if we turn the God into fantasy, he is in us and is easy to bear. The God outside us increases the weight of everything heavy, while the God within us lightens everything heavy. Hence, all Christophers have stooped backs and short breaths since the world is heavy. Many have wanted to get help for their sick God and were then devoured by the serpents and dragons lur lurking on the way to the sun of the to the land of the sun this perished in the over they perished in the overbright day and have become dark men since their eyes have been blinded now they go around like shadows and speak of light but little but see little but their god is in everything that they do not see. He is in the dark western lands, and he sharpens seeing eyes, and he insists those cooking the poison, and he guides serpents to the heels of the blind perpetrators. Therefore, if you are clever, take the God with you. Then you know where he is. If you do not have him with you in the western lands, he will come running to you at night with clanking armor and a crushing battle axe. If you do not have him with you in the land of the dawn, then you will step unawares on the divine worm who awaits your unsuspecting heel. You gain everything from the God whom you bear, but not his weapon, since he crushed it. He who conquers needs weapons, needs weapons, but what else do you want to conquer? You cannot conquer more than the earth. And what is the earth? It is round all over and hangs like a drop in the cosmos. You will not reach the sun, and your power will not even extend to the barren moon. You will conquer neither the sea, nor the snow on the poles, nor the sands of the desert, but only a few spots on the green earth. You will not conquer anything for any length of time. Your power will turn into dust tomorrow. For above all, at the very least, you must conquer death. So do not be a fool. Throw down your weapon. God himself smashed his weapon. Armor is enough to protect you from fools who still suffer from the need to conquer. God, to conquer. God's armor will make you an uh, invulnerable and invisible to the worst of fools. Take your God with you. Bear him down to your dark land where people live who rub their eyes each morning and yet always see only the same thing and never anything else. Bring your God down to the haze pregnant with poison, but not like those blinded ones who try to illuminate the darkness with lanterns which it does not comprehend. Instead, secretly carry your God to a hospitable roof. The huts of men are small, and they cannot welcome the God despite their hospitality and willingness. Hence, do not wait until rawly bungled hand, bungling hands of men hack your God to pieces, but embrace him again lovingly until he is taken to the form of his first beginning. Let no human eye see the much loved, terribly splendid one in the state of the illness and lack of power. Consider, consider that your fellow men are animals without knowing it. So long as they go to pasture or lie in the sun or suckling their young or suckle their young or mate with each other, 
They are beautiful and harmless creatures of dark Mother Earth. But if the God appears, they begin to rave, since the nearness of God makes people rave. They tremble with fear and fury and suddenly attack one another in fratricide struggles, since one senses the approaching God in the other. So conceal the God that you have taken with you. Let them rave and maul each other. Your voice is too weak for those raging to be able to hear. Thus do not speak and do not show the God, but sit in a solitary place and sing incantations in the ancient manner. Set the egg before you. The God is in, the be in his beginning and behold it and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. Here the incantations begin. I'm going to stop there. So let us let us uh, let's talk. I love the and incubate it with the magical warmth of your gaze. And you know Joseph Campbell, the eyes being the inroads inroads to the soul. So the magical warmth of your gaze. The soul is depth, deep, unconscious, personal, below spirit being light, conscious, public above. And it's interesting, the warmth of your gaze coming from that darkness, the depths of your soul. So there's a, that again, that's the healing power which resides in the unconscious in the incubated with the magical warmth of your gaze, meaning pour out your soul on it to keep it warm and alive. Right. Um, and so this is how Jung found the living God and did not speak of the living God so much in his lifetime mm -hmm. because um, you either have to believe what someone else says or you know. And nope, you froze. Yeah, I, I I actually didn't froze. I just stopped talking. Uh, oh, ninja! And, and, <laughs> and young, young, um, young surely knew. And this is what I've just read: is the moment when he realized that everything about religion. Mm -hmm is in the unconscious it's a fantasy yes it's a fantasy but it's no less real you know um and at page or i'm sorry at paragraph 751 of answer to job uh jung says explicitly what people don't seem to be able to comprehend is that I believe the unconscious is real. Mm -hmm. And and that page and paragraph 751 and 752 uh, I do explicitly say it at the end of his life, but he never said it before then mm -hmm. that I know of. And, uh, and so... Um, yeah, Michelle says it's pearls before swines. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting, too, the set the egg before you, the God in his beginning. And then now what that's kind of sparking in me is that Jung there, so small, is the acorn. And Isdabar is the hatched oak tree. And yeah. you get the, the full nature rather than with all the reason it's constricting containing and makes life small like Jung in the painting whereas acorn cracks open and here comes the whole oak tree basically nature incarnate and right. it has no limits though it sees you know things over there beyond yeah. so it's interesting that reason can defy infinity except without it and just with nature it becomes wonderfully mythical and then consequently magical. Yeah, and it, it's to me, it's it's very prophetic what we've observed only in the past week. So yeah. a week ago today, 
uh, those men entered the entered the um, uh, submersible, and they thought that they were going to see something down in the dark. And someone who knows something about the pressures at that depth, uh, the pressures of of uh, the weight of the Eiffel Tower or the the Empire State Building being forced down on this submersible. Uh, what if you had been staring? If there was a a camera which was watching this thing as it failed, it would have simply vanished. It would have simply vanished. That's a that's a fantastic metaphor. So, <laughs> in terms of understanding what happens to the human body and to a submersible that can't support the weight uh, is that it it gets squeezed down to a point. Um, and yes, there may be shards of carbon fiber there on the seafloor after the fact, but there won't be any human remains. There might there might be shoes, which is what what they found um, when they originally found the the Titanic, they found lots of shoes sitting on the bottom. And the reason is that the human bodies that were in those shoes vanished. Okay, they weren't eaten by sharks. They just vanished because of the pressure. Mm -hmm. and, and the only thing that could survive was the shoes. Uh, and... Uh, so that's one, and the other uh, was the uh, invasion of Russia by the the Wagner Group yesterday, uh, where you know they were eyeball to eyeball, and Prigozhin blinked, uh, and what looked like a a serious threat to the Putin. Um, the Putin regime simply vanished, okay, and you know, and almost in a heartbeat. I mean, <laughs> when you think about what happened, it it just vanished. It was it was a fantasy that Grigorjian was having, and that he wasn't, and it was just gone, and. Um, you know, it's unclear what will happen here in the physical world as an aftermath to that. I don't know that Prigozhin will survive, and I don't know that Putin will survive. But that fantasy that Prigozhin had vanished. It was an amazing thing. And and so, um, you know, we have to cultivate something that we can hang on to and, and appreciate. And that's what I came to realize is that's where the living God is. The living God is within uh, within us and we have to all of us who have written off God is dead have to go back and reevaluate it be within us what it is okay what drives us to do things okay and um, you know I, I certainly can, point to any number of things in my own life where that has happened. Um, and uh, you know, so so in my view, th those two nights of January 8th and January 9th, 1914, were the moment when Jung himself, found the living God.
Mm-hmm. And uh, interesting too about the submersible. Back to that. I mean, ironically named Titanic. Um, but um, when something in, implodes at that kind of pressure, it's so instantaneous that the force of the frictional energy actually creates heat instantly, almost or even more at the level of the sun itself. So mm. in, a, in a nanosecond, it's in, anything inside is incinerated as it just disappears into its singularity nothingness. It's just, and right. like you said, there may be shards that blow off because there's always outblast from any kind of explosion or implosion, but that you, you literally have the same kind of forces present as in imploding, you know, for fission right. with any kind of nuclear work. Um, which is, it's, it's kind of an, a strangely magical expression of how forces happen where the speed equals the power. Right. And so, yeah. On, on, some, on the bright side, some good news is that at least this month, the Prince of Jordan got married to uh, an architect. So that's really nice. It was a very beautiful wedding. Oh. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to share in, uh, I think it was dyes in the dyes chapter, but if you watch closely, you will see what you have never seen before, namely that things live their life and that they live off you, grow through you, and they cause, and they are the cause of your death. And this sentence, well, this mini paragraph sort of like resonates. Aphrodite, stop it. Sorry about that, my cat. <laughs> um, resonates with, with me in the interpretation of take your God with you, bear him down your dark land where people live, who rub their eyes each morning. Uh, you know, let no human see the much love terribly first beginning. You know, so it's all about like seeing what can be seen and what cannot be seen, but also accepting the divinity of that which is unknown uh, can also sort of be your truth in your own life. Because what you can only see is your message for your beginning and your end. So somewhere in the middle is how you yourself are living your life and the decisions that you make and how the whole universe is reflecting on that which you do or do not do or think or become and whatnot. And I personally can relate to that because I've made a lot of sacrifices in my own, in my own personal life. And um, I don't feel so upset or ashamed about my sacrifices because of my spirituality and the way that I was brought up and how I was taught and my own worldview. So that is like my logos and I feel like the more that I have sacrificed, that was reasonable. <laughs> um, the more knowledge, the wealth of knowledge that I've obtained, and there is, there are a lot more other things that I have obtained from that trade-off, if you will. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it's very enlightening. It really is, you know, to be able to, to feel that, that acceptance of, of reality and what is, and, you know, sort of just letting go and, and allowing for that flow of the unknown to reveal itself. And I think that's the response from nature which is something that we cannot control. But if we did try to control, we'd be in big trouble if we tried to control nature. 
Right. Yeah, that's where I, I take the word control, throw it out the window and substitute the verb navigate, because I think that it's a living verb that works with nature because can you, you're right you try to control nature and you have that implosion <laughs> that's 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 kind of a prime example you're, you're right on the money you're right on the money yeah and i think that's the issue with gilgamesh and napoleon and um alexander the great and all of these people who you know whether they wanted to unite the world as one or if they just wanted to conquer the world as one the problem was that they were so even though they navigated and planned and had their strategies they were very primitive about you know how they were going to go about you know accomplishing that because for example alexander the great you know, legend has it that he was mushed by elephants. And so he did not accept that, you know, in nature, you want to, you know, succeed or overpower and, and uh, it doesn't, you know, not everything is going to go as planned because, you know, sometimes some animals are way larger than what you think. And so the Mm -hmm. unknown became the death of him yep yeah the hubris, <laughs> you know, the, the hubris of going up against an elephant i mean it, a rhino will even be pushed away by an elephant i mean half the time i mean mm. so yeah um well i think it's um kind of interesting synchronicity too that we have the new movie oppenheimer coming out, it seems that in every generation we have to have um, have a movie about the creation of the atomic bomb and um, and of course uh, Oppenheimer at the time of, of the original atom bomb test in Alamogordo um, Los Alamos. Yes. Los Alamos uh, called himself, you know, I am, am death or something like that. Yeah, I have, be- I am become death. I, I, I am become death. Yeah. And, and so, and, and that God, which is, uh, was originally only in the imagination of Einstein, mm-hmm. um, turns out to be the one that might in the end get us. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. uh, and of course they're looking for the, the fusion God, which is the idea of fusion energy is that you can take uh, seawater and a drop of seawater will produce enough power to power a city for a year um and because it but you have to bring to bear on it an incredible amount of heat in order for that to happen um in order for fusion to happen and well it's interesting to me fusion has always perplexed me because um <laughs> just just like the atom bomb that's a that's a actual example of what it looked like at the implosion um of of the submersible yeah but then fusion creates more energy than was there before so you know taking the potential energy of the dark matter or the negative space the thing is if there's more than there was before then we're cracking the egg i mean there's a whole where does it does it have limits? How do you actually regulate that in a way where, like you said, massive heat, but, you know, the power goes off and oops, you know, I mean, so relying too much on the tools, I mean, or does the fusion, I'm not clear on it, I'm not a physicist, but does the fusion then self-perpetuate or do you have to keep it in that certain environment? Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah. Diane, I'm sorry, can I share, before we continue with the atomic 
<laughs> yeah, we're, uh, I, I'm going to stop here on the Red Book, but I do have uh, one answer to something okay. on YouTube. But go ahead, Amelia. Yeah, so there, uh, my partner and I, we went to this thrift shop in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest. And uh, so everything that you want to donate, you just throw it in this little wagon it's so vintage it's this vintage wagon that they use for hay <laughs> and um, they have like a small drop-in shelter for for what they call battered women mm -hmm. and so it's women who have escaped like domestic violence with their children and so there was this so we're in there we're observing everything it's this huge thrift shop it looks like a ginormous like fallout shelter <laughs> mm -hmm. and my boyfriend and I are browsing and we're looking for stuff and then we finally meet each other at the register mm -hmm. and there was this woman with a plastic baby doll that I saw and I thought it was really creepy so I'm like hey look at this isn't this weird <laughs> it was a vintage like world war ii-ish kind of baby doll and it had like all the, the diaper and the baby clothes with the bib. And it was so creepy looking. And it made me think of the, the props that they had when they were, when they threw the, 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 the nuclear bombs in Mexico, in New Mexico to like test them out. So lo and behold, there's this elderly woman and she's in front of us on the line and she chose the doll. Oh, she and she goes over to pay for it and she's like do you by any chance know who donated this and they're like no and she's like well you know sometimes people they go into this dangerous area where there's high radiation and they take the props and they donate them and it's highly radioactive and she's like i don't have my device with me <laughs> uh, got your like, counter <laughs> Yeah. So she's like, do you have a veteran's discount? And they were like, no, we don't have a veteran's discount. And she was like, okay, but if I find out this is stolen property, I'm going to have some of my friends come out here just because I'm retired doesn't mean that I quit my job. Uh, <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, okay. So there's a good question. Oh, you froze up there. Right. Yeah. There's a good question on YouTube. I think that the collective unconscious is really unconscious, as Jung would say. And could you repeat the YouTube question? You froze right when the, there's a really great question. I, OK. That's where... Yeah. The YouTube question is, couldn't one say the oceanic feeling is an example of the collective unconscious. And my answer to this is twofold. First, uh, Dr. Jung's dictum was that the unconscious is really unconscious. Okay. And it's not something that you can bring up to consciousness necessarily. And number two, the objective of our confluence in California in October uh, is to give the participants an experience of the collective unconscious, not to define it, uh, because that would be impossible, but to experience it. And... Um, and so I, I hope many of you will come uh, to California uh, in October. The official dates are the 12th to the 15th of October, but um, I'll be flying on the 11th, I think. And um, there's going to be a couple of days worth of tours after the confluence, uh, which will include... Um, visits to uh, the homes of uh, of Colleen Kiber and uh, Mary Holmes. And it will also include, uh, I believe, we haven't finally decided on this, but we're, uh, it was raised at our last meeting. Um, it will also include 
uh, Tim Holmes's family cottage, which is in Carmel by the sea. And that is a place that has to be seen to be believed, but uh, I've been there and stayed there one weekend last year. And um, it, it's a remarkable place. It, uh, the story is that, that Tim's aunt um, was a, uh, a nurse during World War I, okay? And she went to Europe and, and served as a nurse. And um, when she came back, uh, she stay, she and her partner, it turned out she was lesbian. Um, she and her partner um, bought this cottage at a time when there weren't many people moving to California. This was in 1919, I believe. And the house has been in the family ever since. It's a, it's a wonderful building, probably was built by a committee. In other words, it had additions uh, over time. And, um, and it's just filled with Tim Holmes's art. Uh, and, uh, it's, it just, I can't tell you how powerful it is. You just have to experience it to appreciate it. And, uh, so I hope we do that. I hope we do that. And, uh, I expect that we will. And, um, and so, um, we, we still don't have the official registration page up, uh, but, uh, we, but it will be up within this week. Uh, and so I'm going to put the, uh, the website up here so that you can find it and find the description of it. Um, there's a short video introduction there. Um, and there's one other thing that I wanted to put up here, which is I um, wanted to put up the link so that you can, if you're on YouTube, uh, you can register for our mailing list so that you can also join our panels. And I want to make sure that I put that up. I don't often put it up, but I, I think that I've had a number of people ask me about different parts of our program. And so the if you haven't registered, uh, if you look on YouTube right now, you'll see the link to our uh, MailChimp um, page and you can be added to the, the to the list that will bring you into here into the into the Zoom panel if you wish to be a part of it. And also the the unconscious comment um, and the oceanic feeling. Yes, uh, go ahead. You know, with Jung, I mean, the ocean is actually Jung's symbol of the unconscious. True. And I take it further. You have the collective conscious. That's the ocean. I call it the, the unconscious, the midnight ocean. So you get, you know, the dark and the dark. And I think the depths there, the ocean, that oceanic feeling, definitely that's attributed to the unconscious. Yeah. And, uh, and don't get lost. Just, just mentioning <laughs> synchronicity here for a moment. Um, last week, um, there were, there are 16 children who are suing the state of Montana for not paying attention to environmental issues and uh it's in federal court or it was i don't know if it's finally been resolved as yet uh, and um in any case um this morning i woke up to the news that a montana bridge has collapsed sending train carrying hazardous materials into the yellowstone river the derailment 
uh, let's see, the derailment and collapse into the Yellowstone River near Billings involved as many as eight cars with, the, with those carrying molten sulfur and asphalt described as compromised. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> I if if the if the children lost their their uh, suit last week and I I don't I haven't heard the news, um, then this would be the karma that comes back from that and instantly. <laughs> well, and that's the kind of it's interesting in um, in Philadelphia there you know that that tanker truck caught on fire under a section of I ninety five eighty five. I ninety five, yeah. I ninety five, and you know, steel when it subjects is subjected to high heat buckles. So I'm not saying that that's you know, bridge maintenance issue, but the thing is, these pieces of infrastructure that are crumbling pre pretty consistently are 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 pretty alarming, frankly. You know, you, you kind of yeah. start to hear the little the little cues of, excuse me, upgrade upgrade i mean yeah. well and and our erstwhile gop has been standing in the in the way of upgrading our transportation systems for decades now yeah and, we have the train system and actually on the planet just about and they need to they they, they need to be swept away so that we can repair our bridges um so on so that's total hubris when we don't repair our bridges and think we can get away with it it's it's no also, different it's no different than the titan going down to a, a depth where the a measure yeah it's also a metaphor to build bridges you know make connection not yeah absolutely you know conflict and dissension um, yeah uh honestly and, not even agreeing to disagree yeah. disagreement without conflict is wonderful because then you have two different perspectives to draw from i mean it's i started yeah. to think that um the american political system carries everyone up to about 17 you know zero to seven you're with the moms at seven to 14 you move towards the dad to get form then you go out with competition and winning and then there's a point where well what's the value and, you know, I think right now we're seeing all this um, even more than there always has been a lack of substance and just a lot of bickering. And it's just adolescent that and I no offense to adolescents, because I know a lot of adolescents who are a lot more mature than most politicians. So. So I, I just was looking for the Montana kids lawsuit. I don't seem to have a result yet. So it may be that the that the judge has has uh, taken the, the judgment under advisement. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, so I, because I think the trial is over. And it was uh, the the trial was in Helena, and uh, right, okay. So I don't I don't see a result as yet, and so it's possible that they have uh, that the judge now sees. Uh, <laughs> In reality, I mean, the, the defense of the state in the Montana lawsuit was that no matter how bad Montana's pollution is, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the rest of the country. So we shouldn't be required to change. That was it. That was the excuse. That's a that's a legal defense. So that's the oh, look, we're less poisonous than them. I mean, it, but that's still the, oh, we're poisonous, but we're less poisonous. I, that... Yeah. And so uh, it, here's the end of this article. It says the case, which was heard June 12th to the 19th, was a bench trial, meaning that there was no jury present. Judge Kathy Seeley 
alone will render a decision which the attorneys expect to be forthcoming within 60 days. So there's no, no decision as yet. Um, and uh, so she, uh, it's a bench trial. She's the one that's going to decide. And, um, and that means that she heard all the evidence and now she goes like uh, just as a jury would do now she's considering her decision and she'll report out her decision in due course so um and apparently there are uh, even before the ruling comes down however the suit is teeing up other similar cases both here and around the world and so anyway that's that and so interesting okay so peace everyone and uh have a have a good week you it's, too thank you it's been a wonderful romp next yeah. week we're, we're gonna we're gonna do the uh incantations and then continue on oh you have a black cat amila beautiful yeah isn't that cool this is aphrodite is, hey, she completely, is she completely black? Yes. Wow. Uh -huh. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Does she crush your bath much? <laughs> She's, okay. She loves attention and snuggles and just everything about her name fits her perfectly. Nice. Right. right. Okay. All right, so we will uh, we will see you next week. Sounds good. And take care. And thanks for being here, Patrick. Nice to see you today, and we'll see you soon. Bye bye. And be careful with well-attentioned people because it might be <laughs> radioactive. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, and, and don't dive into abysses if you can avoid it. It's it's. There's a lot well, of pressure. There's a lot note, of pressure on you if you do that. <laughs> on that note, you know, with Nietzsche's, you know, if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss gazes back. But I always add, yeah, but if you gaze too long into the abyss, the totality of the nothingness will lean forward and say, it's really rude to stare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>